Color and Vision Portraits in Art. I'm Julia Batchelor. One of the many beautiful aspects of art is how it refuses to be easily defined. It's not confined to the narrow boundaries of one medium, but it encompasses an expanse of genres. On today's program, we meet three artists working in vastly different mediums. Frank Gross is a longtime professional photographer who finds his inspiration in the everyday moments of life. Helen O'Sullivan is an artisan that creates using the medium of fiber. First up is Susan Walker Ng, in her words, a person who was born an artist. She began her formal training at the age of seven, a way for her parents to channel her creativity away from the walls of their home and onto canvas. From there, she has painted in oils, watercolor, studied art history in university, curated at galleries, and studied abroad in Italy, painting in the old world fashion of en plein air. Art is the most important thing in the world. <laughs> it's, it should be part of your education. It should be something that you think of all the time because art and creativity builds everything. Once I start painting, I'm just in a zone and time passes so quickly and it just lightens my heart, my mood, everything. It's just like music going on in my head. Plein air is a very historical way of painting, and it means that come rain, come shine, uh, you paint outside. And so the joy of painting outside is the challenges that it faces uh, the artist. You, you have to deal with the environment, you have to deal with um, carrying your supplies, being portable, knowing what you need, and looking at the subject and quickly translating almost as though it was a snapshot of that time and that space. And it's your first impression of why do I want to paint this and what, what's so great about it. You want to be able to translate that to the viewer so that when they see your painting, they get a feeling of what you first experienced. So it can give you an experience and plein air is very challenging. <laughs> uh, the paint reacts differently to every different type of uh, season. Uh, it can be too hot, too cold, too wet. Um, and so that are, though, I love those kind of challenges. You have to work extremely fast and you have to be very articulate with the paint. You need to plot it out quickly. And I love those challenges. When I'm looking at a subject, I can tell what medium I need to paint it in based on the way it looks. So if I'm outside and I see this soft, uh, distant um, feel, something that's more atmospheric, watercolors are awesome for that because it, they're transparent, they're, you know, they give you surprises and colors merge and it's, the medium is, is fabulous for that, that soft, beautiful transparency. But I like the hard, uh, strong colors of oils too. So I've actually come up with um, combining the two mediums and I have a little prototype that I've done where I'm doing a painting that is soft and diffused that might be the background or one specific area and then I do part of it, part of it in watercolors and part of it in oils. So I've, I've won some awards doing that. They're calling it alternative medium but I really do like, love both mediums for two different reasons and combining it has been kind of a goal of mine because of course watercolor is done on paper, oils are done on canvas, so the two different um, platforms led me to kind of merge the two. I tried to take a canvas and make it feel like paper but that, that didn't go so well so I decided well I'm just going to do a watercolor on paper and I'm going to affix it onto a canvas and, and sort of cut out. You'll see from one of a couple of my paintings, the, the prototypes of what I've done, how I can merge the two mediums into a, a I think, an interesting feel. What 
inspires me? Well, I guess just life. I think really looking around you at the things that people look at every day and I make them look at those commonplace things and, and realize that they're special. You know, the way water trickles through rocks and how sunlight dances on surface of water, how light filters through trees, how you can, you can almost hear the birds when you can see something. It's, it's such a total experience that inspiration is absolutely everywhere. The meaning of art for me, it's who I am. It defines me. It helps motivate me every day. It's gotten me through a lot of crises, <laughs> emotional or otherwise. I've, I'm now the other side of cancer, and I couldn't wait to, to start painting. And, I, and there was a time I didn't think of artwork because it was pretty sad and gray. And when I first started painting, the thing that I painted I, it was enough strength to walk to Mackenzie Marsh at the end of my street. And I, I mean, it's so close, I can walk there in a, in a couple minutes, but I was so weak that I had to get a ride there. And so the first painting I did when I was well enough and I started thinking art again was Mackenzie Marsh. And that painting sold. And I didn't realize, because I've seen it now in the people's house, how emotional that sky is. So art to me is in my soul. I mean, it's something that that you can't even touch. It's just an absolute part of the way I see things, the way I talk, the way I am, the way I dress. Art, to me, is who I am. Welcome back. Frank Gross began his career in commercial photography in his native country of Cape Town, South Africa, and segued his talents into the world of directing television commercials here in Canada. When an illness waylaid Frank's career for over a decade, he found himself too far removed from that world to return and decided to refocus his energies on his original passion and now makes photography his full-time career. I create art because I get engaged and it puts me into a focus, into a zone. And, and, and in fact, if I don't do photography, I start to feel unwell. It's almost like this is what I need to do in order to be a good human being. I, I need to be able to get out there, work and look and look deeply and look beneath the, the obvious and look beneath the surface. So for me personally, it's a very important process to do. Whatever genre of photography I'm currently engaged in, whether that be portraiture or uh, street photography or still life, I think I'm driven mostly by um, a sense of composition, that you have this rectangular frame that you have to fill, and how you fill it and how interesting you can make it is, is, is paramount. Um, so I'm always looking uh, for example, in portraiture, at the shape of the of, of of the body, like what kind of an outline does it make against the background? I look for uh, a, a gesture that is interesting and fills the frame nicely. Um, I also look for something quite real in portraiture, not that it has to be a huge smile at the camera. Just just try and see the person behind the person, as it were and look for those in-between moments when somebody reveals themselves a little more personally. And in street photography, similarly, I look for textures, colors, lines, 
uh, patches of uh, interesting something, um, shapes, forms. And when it comes to still life, really the same thing. It, 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 it's a, how you fill the frame. What shapes are you bringing in? What colors are you introducing? And uh, just trying to make uh, beauty out of not much. You know. I um, get my inspiration just from life in itself. Um, I, I, tr I try to find beauty in the banal. I try and look for what's extraordinary in the ordinary. And, um, and that kind of drives me to keep my eyes open and stay conscious and, and look around and, and see what, that everything is worthwhile. There's, it's, you don't have to travel to an exotic place to uh, find uh, uh, beauty. You can find that in your backyard or your nearest park or ravine or whatever you have access to. Light is um, probably at the essence of photography. It's, uh, well, the word photography comes from the Greek photographus, which is writing with light, I think. Um, and it's almost like whatever you, have in front of your camera. If the light is nice on it, it'll be beautiful. If it's an old pair of boots that was kicked off at the front door, or if it's a beautiful landscape a, a vista scene, if the light is beautiful, it'll be beautiful. And if the light is not so great, it's going to be harder work to make it a good photograph. So I think for photographers, light is paramount. It also introduces nuance of, of, of shadow and light. and. Um, yeah, it's it's sculptural. It brings out the form in something, the shape. Yeah. We definitely are in the era of um, billions and billions of, of, of photographs, and it's hard for people to discern between good work and not such good work. And you know, the the technology has reached a point where almost anyone can come up with a decent photograph which in the old days would have taken some skill. Um, so whether it becomes questionable as art or not, you know, it's really up to the eye that perceives it and, and, and determines is this something special or isn't it. And, you know, I, I philosophically believe that art is more than just an end result. It's more than an end product, be that a print or a, or a piece of film or a sculpture. It's got more to do with the process of making it and the state of consciousness and the experience that the artist has in making the work. Whether it sells or not or becomes famous or not is almost out of the artist's hands. It's up to you know, gallerists and publicists and, and, and so on. Um, but I believe it's an art because it bring something new into the world. And I think that's essentially what art is. Art's important to our society is an interesting question because if you think back on history and you look at cultures from the past, whether that's Rome or, or whatever, we don't remember the politicians and what they said. We, we, we don't remember the, the businessmen and who made the most money. What we remember, what, what is a relic of a culture or a society, is the art that they leave behind. It's more of a reflection of what was going on at that time and what was around than anything else is. And I think it's, I think it's got historical importance. Um, I think it's got importance as well just because it brings people pleasure. It brings them something uplifting. We're living in quite a tricky world these days. There's so much trouble everywhere. Everyone's so bogged down with bad news of one sort or another that a nice piece of art can just provide you with a little bit of respite from that. Art means um, uh, almost a, a, a quasi-spiritual experience for me. It's a, it, it's a, it's, art is an experience where you go into something so deeply and so focused that you let everything else fall away. And for the time that you're busy working and busy creating art, there is nothing else going on. And in a sense, that creation 
is in collaboration with the greater creation going on in the world around us, which to my way of thinking is still going on. It's not that the world was created and it's, it's a done deal, it's all over. It's a perpetual constant creation going on. And by doing art, I somehow feel that we are linking into that process and joining in with it. When you meet Helen O'Sullivan, she radiates, I think, what is best described as old world charm. Which makes sense, seeing that Helen is in love with a bygone era where everyday items were created by hand, using methods that have been all but lost in our modern industrialized world. As a member of the Burr House Spinner and Weavers Guild, Helen is keeping alive these skills and in the process is creating beautiful pieces of functional fiber art that combine the old world with the modern. I just love anything made by hand, where someone's soul is poured into it. And similarly with fiber, same thing, um, it's something made by hand, it's, an, it's a very old traditional craft, and I love, especially in this modern world where everything is mass produced, I love things that are made by hand. My passion for all things old and past and historic has brought me to this craft. right now interested in felting, that's my main focus. Um, the felting itself is a very old uh, form of creating fabrics. Actually, it's, it predates weaving, it predates knitting. Uh, it goes back, uh, there's a historical evidence of, uh, of a felting um, fabric that was found in Turkey, 6500 BC. So it's, it's very old. Uh, the technique that I'm enjoying is a, a more modern take on felting. It's called Nuno felting. And Nuno felting was developed in Australia by an artist named Polly Sterling. And what she discovered was instead of simply adhering wool to wool, she incorporated de delicate fabrics like silk and felting wool into silk. And the end result is uh, a much lighter, more delicate product, and it's more modern. So I'm really drawn to this because I love the, the contrast between the delicacy of the silk and the coarseness of the wool to make these one-of-a-kind scarves. Um, so it's, it's a, a manual process. Every scarf is done uh, one at a time. Uh, every scarf is different and unique. So it is like wearable art for your neck. And so that's something I like. Same with pottery. It's something that every day you can use and enjoy and, um, and just, it just makes you feel special, I think. The art that I create does tell stories. I find that um, I'm inspired by different things, uh, whether it's nature, color, uh, the, the material itself um, will inspire me. So uh, living in Canada, it, we're so blessed by just so much beauty outside looking out the window. And so the colors of the season I find inspire me quite a bit. So in the winter time, I tend to uh, go towards more cool wintry colors. And then in the summer, I like vibrant, hot punches of color, um, you know, f taking from the flowers and just putting them into the scarves. So uh, that definitely inspires me. But also when we're talking about the textiles, the wools themselves, the beautiful sheep, um, the, whether it's a fine merino wool that's so soft or the coarse Corydale wool, it, it speaks to me and from those textures I build something new. It's a lot of practice really. Um, you, you need the initial instruction to learn the, the fundamentals, but then uh, like anything it's about practice, repetition, doing it again and again until you master the craft and master the feel for the materials. So with potting for instance, uh, I was taught, I had various teachers teaching me different approaches and techniques, but it really just came down to every single day throwing for five hours, six hours. Um, and the, the early work um, is not so good. It's 
thick and it's heavy, but with more repetition and practice, the, the, you get better control over the material and you become better, so just practice. And similarly with fibers, um, I received some instruction here at uh, the guild that I belong to, but then um, it also comes down to just doing it and learning through trial and error. I think it's important to keep these traditions going in this modern world where everything is mass produced, um, to remember where these things come from. Um, I'm, I'm a history teacher or a history major, and so I, I have a great respect for things that are made by hand. Hundreds of years ago, everything was made by hand. So the, the shirt that I was we I'm wearing, first they would have uh, extracted the fiber, then combed and carded the fiber, then spun the fiber into thread, then weave the thread into fabric, then cut the fabric and sew it into a garment. So much love. Uh, that what goes into every piece. And so we're trying to keep those traditions alive here and remember and respect uh, the, the fibers, the, the animals that donate the material, the earth that donates the material, and just the idea of making things by hand. Art brings us joy, I think. I think that uh, for, for myself, um, I find that art is an escape from, from stresses of life. While I'm creating, my mind is just on whatever it is that I'm making. So all the cares and worries of my day are forgotten, and I focus on whatever it is that I'm making. And even when I go to bed at night, instead of thinking about what happened during the day, I'm thinking about what my next scarf is going to be or what colors do I want to use. So it's a great outlet, and I think that it's an outlet that everyone should um, should experience. I, I speak to a lot of people and they say, oh, I'm not artistic, I don't have any talent. And I, I say, no, I think everybody has an artistic side and inside of them they just have to nurture it and bring it out. And I think that it would provide a great enjoyment for a lot of people. I, I would encourage anybody who's not currently involved in some art form to try something. Paul Klee once said, art does not reproduce what we see, it makes us see. An artist has the ability to find clarity in that moment and interpret it using his or her medium, whether it's through the lens, using fibers, or painting in oils. I hope you have enjoyed today's program, and perhaps these artists have inspired you to get out and see the world through a more creative lens. Go and capture those moments in your own unique way. If you're interested in learning about fiber arts, the Burr House Spinner and Weavers Guild, located in Richmond Hill, do offer classes, memberships, and have open houses. If you'd like to hire or purchase work from any of our artists, please visit our website for contact information. Thank you for watching Color and Vision. I'm Julia Batchelor, and we'll see you next time.